Hi everyone. So I am Ginger Nickerson and I work with the urban with Vermont's Urban and Community Forestry Program, which is a partnership between um, the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation and UVM Extension. And oh, and I'm Judy Rosovsky. I'm the state entomologist. I work for the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, and I also have a job as a state plant regulatory official where I work with people from the U.S. Department of Agriculture trying to safeguard our food crops from bad insects. Oh, and I forgot to say that I am the forest pest education coordinator for the Urban and Community Forestry Program. So um, the session today is on environmental action and crime, and Judy and I are going to interview each other about our work with invasive forest insects. So, um, Judy, let's start with you. Could you tell me what you, um, you know, what your work as the state entomologist, what do you actually do? Right. So one thing I do as a state entomologist is I, um, I collect insects and I maintain an insect collection. And I'm going to show you some of the tools of the trade in a minute. But I also help protect, like I said, agricultural crops from pests. And so I have to identify pests. That's a lot of what I do is identify insects. And then I give people advice on how to um, manage them, what to do about them. Um, but first, I have to identify them. So one thing I do, I can, I'm going to bring the computer over here to show you some of the things I use. One of the easiest ways to collect insects is to use a net. <laughs> and you just swoop the insects up in the net. We also use traps. And you can see, whoops, some of the insects um, that are caught in the trap. And then each insect gets a label with um, its name, date, and location, and who collected it. And then when you figure out what it is by using this assortment of um, books and online references, um, then you put a label which has insect's name on it. And so sometimes trying to find out People will call me and they'll say, well, I have a big green insect. And there are a lot of big green insects. So then I have to um, do a little detective work to figure out, well, what big green insect is it? And you might ask yourself, well, why don't they just take a picture on their iPhone and send it to you? But a lot of people um, in Vermont don't have phones. They don't know how to use them. They haven't figured out how to send a picture. So then I have to, you know, First of all, is it an insect? And I don't know if you know what an insect is, but it usually has six legs and um, two antenna. Um, some have wings, some don't. So I just start asking a bunch of questions. You know, um, does it look like a caterpillar? Does it hop? Is it crawling? What plant was it on? Does it have any other colors on it? So I just try to figure out, just to narrow down what it might be so that I can tell people what they have. Um, and if all else fails, I go out there and look at it. Um, so that's a lot of what I do. And then the other thing is um, people need permits to do certain things like, um, trying to think of an insect related one. Uh, you know, if they want to collect insects in the state, then they need to get a permit from me. So that part is a boring paperwork, but it's helpful. So yeah, I think, um, and then I work with other great people in the state like Ginger working on projects like um, finding out where the emerald ash borer is or other pests that we're concerned about, where they are, and helping people um, sort of manage them. Cool. That sound right? So, and how did you end up becoming an entomologist? What was the path that took you to your current job? Right. Well, I, um, I ended up working in a lab with um, uh, Dr. Bruce Parker, who's still up at University of Vermont, and his um, uh, close colleague, Margaret Skinner. Um, and I was working on gypsy moth, which is, um, we don't see it much around here because there's a fungus that came in and basically wiped out most of the gypsy moth. Um, but at the time, it was a pest. And we did a few spray treatments with a fungus um, to knock back the populations. So I did that, and then I started um, teaching up at Johnson State College. I was an adjunct instructor, so that's a part-time teaching person. But um, in order to support myself, I also had two other part-time jobs. 
and one was with the U.S. Department of Agriculture Plant Protection and Quarantine, that's a mouthful, um, and they did a lot of invasive insect work, which I find really interesting, and that's what my educational background um, was in. So I spent a lot of time hanging up purple sticky traps, those big purple boxes you see up in the trees. Um, and I got to know the people in the state. And so when their state entomologist retired, um, I applied for that position. And that's how I became an entomologist. Cool. So uh, excuse me, everyone, there's my cat. <laughs> so can you, what does a, like a typical or average day look like for you? <laughs> can you describe what that might be like from you know, beginning to end? Sure. So um, remembering that in Vermont we have seasons. So in the winter is the um, indoor season because there's not a lot of insect activity. Most of them are hunkered down for the winter, hiding somewhere. But um, so I do a lot of paperwork and I work on the insect collection, making those labels and things like that. And, um, and then in the summertime, um, part of what I do is I inspect nurseries. Nurseries are places that grow plants for sale. And uh, it's a tough job. You know, I go to these places and there are all these beautiful plants and I spend my day looking at beautiful plants. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm looking for hungry insects eating the beautiful plants. So uh, I spend a lot of time doing that. And then I, um, you know, people have insects in their houses and they're trying to figure out what they are, what to do about them. So I'll go look at those. And then we're always looking for the big invasives like the emerald ash borer, which unfortunately we found or the Asian longhorn beetle, which we don't have in Vermont. Um, and, you know, so dealing with stuff like that. Um, I run around outdoors a lot in the summer. It's pretty great. Oh, that does um, sound good. I know that's why a lot of people want to go into biology, so they get to run around outside. Yep. Um, so what do you like the best about your work? And what do you maybe like the least or is the most challenging? Um, well, you know, so I work in Vermont. Vermont's a beautiful state. I get to drive around this beautiful state and go to these beautiful nurseries. And I work with incredible people who work for the state and I meet people all over the place, really friendly, nice people. I get to talk to lots of folks. I just love that. You know, it's just, we just live in a really remarkable place. The people and the, um, the terrain and the scenery, just incredible. So that part is great. Um, the part I like less is there's a lot of forms we have to fill out or, you know, paperwork that we have to do. So that is, that is not so interesting, but um, all jobs have that. So you, you try to cope. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so is there anything else that you want to say or? Um... Sure. So I encourage um, people who, like to be outdoors to go out and look for all the insects there are always insects everywhere you just need to start looking for them and if you see them you know try to figure out what they are it's pretty easy go online and see pictures or ask an entomologist you can always contact me um, or um, ask your teacher <laughs> so um, and then when you're looking at them look at what they're doing it's a great way to learn biology and behavior um, just go out, what are they doing? What are they eating? What are they on? Are they interacting with each other? Do they seem to like light or shade or moist places or dry places? It's like an endless science experiment to go out and watch insects out in the world. So I encourage you to do that. It is very cool. Have you ever seen Caterpillar Lab? The one that guy in New Hampshire does? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's incredible. I saw it at Mon in Montpelier for their BioBlitz. Oh, I was blown away that if you get to see that, go see that. Yeah, I know that they um, sometimes come to bins. So maybe um, Michelle or someone can uh, share a little bit about that. But if you're interested in, in insects, definitely check out Caterpillar Lab. It's very All cool. Right. Great. Well, Ginger, I think now it's um, my turn to ask you some questions. Sure, shoot. So um, what on earth do you do for work? <laughs> <laughs> so as I said, I am the forest pest education coordinator for um, UVM Extension and the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program. And um, basically, I kind of have two 
parts to my job. Um, one part is I provide information and support to towns and cities in Vermont uh, and to just regular citizens about invasive forest insects and pests. And then the other thing that I do is I manage a group of volunteer citizen scientists called the Forest Pest First Detector Network. And those are interested uh, volunteers, just everyday people who are interested in protecting our forests from invasive pests. And so we have these workshops where we train them to understand, you know, the connection between the the pest and the host plants that it goes after. So, for example, hemlock woolly adelgid hits hemlock trees. Um, Asian longhorn beetle goes after lots of different trees, but including maple trees. So we want to make sure that we're, you know, keeping on top of that and that we don't have that here because we don't want it to affect the maple industry. And um, it. Uh, Emerald ash borer, which we'll be talking some more about, and some different um, invasive invasive insects. So we train them in the life cycle, their relationship with the the host tree, and then how to spot signs and symptoms of those insects to see whether any trees might be infested with them because while we have a lot of state personnel who spend time in the forest there's no way that the state employees can cover you know every acre all the time so we really depend on citizens to be our eyes on the ground and um, they when they see insects that they're concerned about or trees that they're concerned about, they send um, photographs in and let us know on the report it portal on um, VT Invasives, which is a website that our program manages. So people can report when they think they see insects or trees that they're concerned about. And they also help us um, with trapping programs and detecting, you know, monitoring for where those insect infestations might be. And then they also help us do outreach. So at state fairs and, and the farm show and the flower show and other public events, giving talks in schools and things to help people in their community uh, learn about these insects and how to watch out for them. Great. Um, well, you do a lot, it sounds like. So when you're busy doing all that, oh, whoops, wrong question. Um, <laughs> um, what path did you take to get to where you are now? How did you get into the whole urban and community forestry um, career? Yeah, so when I was, I have some visual aids too. <laughs> so when I was in fourth grade, my mom got me this book. Oh, There's yeah. a seal in my sleeping bag. And <laughs> this was written by a wildlife biologist named Lynn Hancock. And um, it, it was just his description of going around the world, living in all of these uh, exotic outdoor places with animals. And I thought, that's what I want to be. I want to be a wildlife biologist. That just sounds so cool. Um, but I ended up focusing on plants because I really, really love plants. And, and I also gravitated towards ecology because in my mind, I really see how, you know, everything in the ecosystem is connected. So I feel like I kind of, I think like a spider web. Oh, if I can get this without glare. Um, you know, in, it, I see everything in the environment as being connected. So I was really drawn to ecology in the way that it really looks at relationships between different components of ecosystems and between people and parts of ecosystems. So I went to 
graduate school and, and first I worked in restoration ecology, trying to restore habitats that had been degraded, focusing on plant community ecology. And when I was doing that, I felt like, you know, I think that the, the biological challenges, the, the biological questions and how to take care of our earth are kind of easier to address than the human, social, political, and economic questions. So um, when I was in graduate school, I studied um, conservation biology, but looking a lot at the human, the cultural um, aspects of that and the sociological aspects. And so for many years, I worked with people, I worked in rural communities, um, training young people, youth. So this is a picture from a project that I did in Nicaragua, where I trained youth to interview seniors in their community about how um, hunting, fishing, farming, logging, herbal medicine, how they had changed over time and um, why people had thought they had changed and what was important to them to conserve. And I did that in lots of different places, including in like Northern Maine, doing it in a watershed in the, in the old days when, camera, when video cameras were that big. Um, so I discovered that I really liked working with people. And then I came and I started working for University of Vermont Extension. And first I worked with fruit and vegetable growers. And then I moved over to the community forestry program and Excellent. so yeah that great. was my path that was your path well that's great um so you were talking a little about the things you do in your job and i was wondering if you wanted to describe a typical day for you because i bet you have a lot of different fun things going on in your work <laughs> Yeah, so there's really no one typical day. It changes a lot. Um, one of the things that I really like about my job is I work in a team. So there's um, usually six of us in this this team and we're in different offices and we spend a lot of time on Zoom. But um, <clears throat> And we all sort of have different roles that we play. But I um you know on an average day i might start out i come into the the office and i get onto my computer and i check and i see if people have submitted any questions about an invasive pest or i've gotten any phone calls and i do my best to try to give them the right information about it um often i will go and do presentations that um a town has set up for their conservation commission or their tree board and other interested people to help them prepare for this infestation of um, emerald ash borer which is going to kill most of the ash trees in Vermont so that's going to be um, costing towns a lot of money so I'm helping towns and communities prepare for that and figure out how they're going to be addressing it and creating management plans. Um, I develop workshops for the forest pest first detectors that I mentioned where we're training them about the natural history of these insects and how to find them and how to share that information with other people. Um, last year I had a project where we made, we worked with a graphic designer to make signs that we um, put up at natural history museums and nature trails around the state. And um, we did a program with the Young Writers Project to challenge young writers to write about the emerald ash borer. And then that was um, put up on Vermont Public Radio and in local newspapers to try to get the word out in different ways. So mostly my job is different ways of either trying to teach people about these insects and the impact they have on our forest or um, answering people's questions when they come to me with their questions. Great. So that keeps you busy. Yeah. Um, and I get to go out in the field with you sometimes. I keep, I, I'm, yeah. I keep pointing in the wrong direction. That's all right. <laughs> Um, yes, it's fun. And we've also done some trainings that have been very helpful for the things that we're both trying to achieve, right? Training volunteers. Um, so um, 
in your average day or just in your average year? What are the things you like the most and what are the things you really avoid, don't like? <laughs> well, what I like the most is mm -hmm. um, getting to work with the volunteers and with wonderful coworkers and colleagues like yourself and um, getting outside and seeing how um, all of the beautiful parts of Vermont um, in all different seasons and working with people who are really, really passionate about trying to protect our forests. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And what do I like the least? Um, I think, you know, sometimes if I'm at the computer for too long and often that I, you know, I might spend a whole day at the computer and that gets a little tiring sometimes, but it's all good. Right. Well then, um, I bet you could tell us the story of how finding Emerald ash borer in the state was kind of like a detective story, right? <laughs> well, you might have, you might, I'm going to ask you to help me with this one, Judy. <laughs> so, so um, I think that we're going to be sharing with you a video of the first discovery. So I'll kind of set it up that, um, you know, Emerald ash borer only attacks ash and it developed in China and Asia and there because it co-evolved in those forests there were lots of um, natural predators and the tr some of the trees had resistance to the pest so while the insect was in China it didn't um, wipe out all of the ash trees. It was mostly infest the trees that were were already weak and sick. But uh, we bring in a lot of wood and wood products from Asia and we think that what happened was that some ash wood came to the U.S. and was had these little larvae probably or maybe an adult beetle hiding in there and then there were probably more than one because it takes more than one and um so what happened was that in michigan was where it was first discovered and the ash trees started dying and um entomologists started trying to figure out what this insect was they had never seen it or heard of it and they finally traced it and identified that it was this um borer from from Asia that was killing all of the ash trees in the Midwest. And so that was in 2002 that it was discovered. And in Vermont, we knew that it was moving across the country and that there were emerald ash borer in new, the states surrounding Vermont, that it was in Quebec, in New York and Massachusetts and New Hampshire and that it was just going to be a matter of time before it arrived in Vermont. So we had our eyes peeled and the forest pest first detractors had been trained in how to look for the signs and symptoms and a lot of forestry personnel had been trained to look for the signs and symptoms. Um, and I believe the state had been putting up traps, monitoring and trying to detect it. Is that true? The um, federal, um, the USDA PPQ, the group I worked for back in the day before I became the state entomologist, um, had been hanging traps from, oh, I don't know, 2006 through maybe 2015. Actually, no, it started later. But anyway, it was something like, 2008 to 2015. Yeah. And the state hung some in some of the state parks um, for a while. Yeah. So we had, so in Vermont, we had been trapping and, well, we had been hanging the traps and monitoring them and checking them to see if the insect was there. But this is a tiny little insect. It's the size of a grain of rice, the adult beetle. And the adult beetles feed up in the canopy of the trees. So you don't see them. And um, you don't know that the tree is infested until it's 
the, they have gone through a few life cycles of the, the adults lay their eggs in the top of the tree. The eggs go into the cambial layer, which is right underneath the bark. And the cambial layer is like the tree's circulatory system. It's how it gets water up to the leaves and sends the nutrients down from the leaves. And so when the eggs turn into larvae, they start to kind of girdle the tree on the inside. They, they eat the cambial layer and form these tunnels, which essentially cut off the circulatory system of the tree. So you don't see the larvae because they're under the bark, but what you might start to, and you don't know that it's there until the tree starts to get sick. The, thinopy, the canopy will thin, and then the woodpeckers know that the insect is there before people do because the woodpeckers like to eat them. So they've got their eyes and ears out. And so one of the other first signs that we'll see is woodpecker activity and ash bark is loose. And when the woodpeckers start pecking on the tree, the bark will start to fall off and form these bald patches. Um, but it's really, really hard to find the infested trees in the early days of the infestation when the, when the ash borer beetle populations are low. We don't start seeing the um, massive die-off of ash trees that they had in the Midwest until there's high population density of the adults and the larvae in any geographic area. So when you say Judy, high population density, you just mean a lot of them, right? A Many lot of them, insects. exactly. Yeah. yeah, lots of them. So, um, so Judy, you were involved in the first detection in Vermont. So do you want to talk about that story? Uh, sure. So, um, so again, we're looking for a tiny insect in a very large wooded state or a state with lots of large wooded areas. And so our strategy, in addition to the purple traps, was trying to train people to know what to look for, like as Ginger just described, the, you know, the woodpecker holes in the trees and the scratched off pieces of bark. And so a um, young smart forester was out in the woods one day and he, he looks at these trees and he's like, huh, hmm, I think I've seen that before. I think I just went to a um, forest and parks training and they showed me what an emerald ash borer um, infestation signs and symptoms are and boy this looks like them. So he took a picture and he put it on report it on vtinvasives.org and um, your colleague Gwen sent that picture around to all of us with a little note that said uh-oh and, <laughs> and we all looked at it and said oh no because even though we'd been looking for this insect I don't know I guess I just was hoping it would never get here. So um, so we saw that and then um, we contacted the person in question. Actually, we had just had a meeting about our emerald ash borer um, action plan, the plan we were gonna have in case we ever found it. And that day that we got that photo, we had the meeting, so we finished the plan and then we all looked at the photo and we all got up and drove to Orange. <laughs> And when, and we didn't actually, um, I didn't have the map um, the forester had sent, but I knew from the photos that it was, a, it would be pretty easy to see. So we just started walking up the trail and finally we saw woodpeck trees and we, um, there's something called a draw knife, which is a blade you can use to scrape the bark off trees. And we scraped the bark off a tree and boy, there they were. That changed my work life. <laughs> So, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, maybe this would be a good time to show the video. Okay, great. And you'll get a chance to see Judy in action in the forest. And so sad to see all these beautiful trees infected with uh, emerald ash borer. And this tree is a classic example of what you can look for if you're trying to find out if your trees have it. These are uh, woodpecker pecks, so they're going up the trunk of the tree. Um, if you look up, 
I don't know if you can see larval damage, but there's, you know, bark missing. Um, and then on this tree, here you can see the characteristic tight serpentine larval galleries um, just under the bark. And you can see some D-shaped exit holes. Uh, that's not always the best field mark, but uh, certainly the larval galleries are a quite unique feature of emerald ash borer infestations. And so are these kind of, um, I don't know if you can see around here, they're sort of these, they don't go too far into the tree, um, but they're woodpecker packs, they're just into where the woodpeckers are gonna find those insects. So what does this damage mean for the tree? Well, so as you can see, so the woodpecker damage is something the tree could withstand, it could create callus tissue over it, but what the problem is gonna be is that these larval galleries are eventually gonna girdle the tree. They're gonna cut off the flow of water and nutrients up and down the tree trunk. If you remember your basic botany, xylem and phloem, uh, the phloem won't be going because um, the galleries will cut it off. And so then the tree can't get water and nutrients into the upper levels and it just starts to die off. And you can see that it's uh, not doing very well here. Probably the galleries don't extend too much around to the other side yet, because I'm not seeing the bark coming off there, but there are obviously insects there because the woodpeckers are going after them. And so just in terms of what we know about uh, the progress of the emerald ash borer, once a tree has emerald ash borer, how long until it's no longer alive? It usually takes about three to five years, um, and then they're dead. Uh, which is quite unfortunate because I'm looking around and there are these beautiful ash trees. There's a beautiful one and you can see it's got the woodpecks on it. Um, there's another nice one, more woodpecks. That one hardly looks damaged at all, but I can see a woodpeck about a 16 feet up there. Oh, they're further in, they're into the wood, right? Oh wow, did you just find some galleries? Yeah. Tons of them here. Holy cow, look at that. And that's an example of a tree that didn't look like it had any symptoms. You got some D-shaped holes. And then as soon as Dan started peeling it, you can yeah, see that. Yeah, but I mean, it has a fair amount of woodpecker oh, activity. You, you know, this woodpecker right here, here. Um, yeah. You know, it was a stress tree. Anyway, it's good. So these crews uh, need to know what the emerald ash borer damage looks like. I and mean, I've looked at a lot of websites, but to have an actual tree that shows a sign is very helpful. And the other reason we're taking these out is that this is private property and the landowner has been very cooperative, but we'd like to bring people in to see the damage and it's easier to do that on public property. So we thought instead of bringing them in to see the trees, we would take the trees out and people can look at them and see the damage there. And there's no concern about transporting the emerald ash borer from here to somewhere else that you're... Um, there's plenty of concern, <laughs> um, but we have big heavy, heavy duty bags and we're gonna bag it and then we're gonna keep the logs in a freezer. So that will um, prevent the further development of the emerald ash borers. Um, as long as they don't warm up, they're just gonna stay in their larval state. So as part of trying to figure out um, how extensive this infestation is, um, because as you know, um, you can have a healthy looking tree and it can be infested. So we are um, going to train crews who will be driving around on roads in Orange County in the coming weeks, um, trying to find trees that look like uh, this one with a woodpecker flex, so that we'll send another crew in, get landowner permission, and see if we can slice into those trees and find the insect. Um, to verify that it's in a, an adjacent town or further out. So that's why it's helpful if you can send us photos and we can say, oh, that's not really emerald ash borer, or, or wow, that is emerald ash borer, and we didn't know it was in that town. We're going to contact that owner and go um, check it out. Many Vermonters know about the restrictions on firewood in the past. Uh, what's the future hold for that? Is it gonna, is, are we gonna have even more quarantines on firewood for in, within Vermont? So um, we do have an existing firewood law um, that's in place and that's to prevent people from bringing firewood in from out of state and we're also trying to prevent people from moving it more than 50 miles. Um, 
So we're asking people to continue to not move firewood. Just because we have the insect here doesn't mean it's okay to move firewood. Once a quarantine is in place, you can move wood within that quarantine area, but we're still asking people to kind of um, not move firewood. There are other invasive insects that can be moved on firewood. It's usually um, the means by which the emerald ash borer has moved from place to place. So um, my best message that citizens can do in addition to identifying trees with damage is not move firewood and continue to not move firewood. One of the problems with finding emerald ash borer is it's often high up in the tree. So I can see those woodpecker pecks coming further down. So I might be able to peel and find some larval galleries, but usually in the early parts of the infestation, the insects are much higher up. So what do people do if they see something that they think is emerald ash borer? The most helpful thing people can do for us right now as we're trying to figure out the extent of this infestation is if you see something that looks like this, the woodpecks, um, larval galleries, take a picture and post it to vtinvasives.org. Or if you know a forester, if you're shy and you don't want to put it up on a website, um, call a forester, county foresters, um, forest and parks personnel, just tell somebody with some connection. Um, ideally, you'd go through vtinvasives.org because that way we can keep track of um, who's contacted us, which of us have gone and contacted them and things like that. But right now we're just trying to figure out where it is. So if you think you have it, let us know. That would be very helpful. Okay, so now um, you've met two scientists and have a little bit more of an understanding of uh, what we do in environmental action and crime. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was great talking to you. And if you have any questions, please be in contact. Yes, it was very fun talking to you. Always great talking with Ginger. And um, my email is judy.rosovsky at vermont.gov if you have any questions about insects or anything else. Yep, have and my here. email is ginger.nickerson at uvm.edu. Take care. Bye. <laughs>